Underground Productions presents Brass, the audio serial, episode 11, Close Calls. The year is 1885, but not one that would be familiar to you, for this is a 19th century that differs in many ways from the one in our history books. For while the 19th century of our world contained many hazards and perils, not even diphtheria, class warfare, or the Gatling gun were quite as terrifying as what now faces Gwendolyn Brass in the gambling pits of the Blackfire Club. A mechanical bear, nearly a hundred stone of metal, pistons, and programmed malevolence, prepares to charge our heroine, who stands with her back at the opposite wall of the pit. Think, Gwendolyn, think. Got to stop his mouth with something. Ha! Should do the trick. Come along, you terror. The bear charges and Gwendolyn stands, motionless as a matador, before leaping aside at the last possible moment and shoving her petticoat into the beast's face. Oh, gained me a moment at best. Now, how does one escape a real bear? No use playing dead or puffing myself up to frighten him. No trees to climb, just that one overhanging beam. I suppose I might jump for it, but it's not out of reach of those claws. And no sign of the off switch. But what was the on switch? Wait, this isn't a bear, it's a machine. So what turned it on? As Gwendolyn looks at the bear, who even now is tearing through her discarded petticoat with his teeth and claws, she sees that the pit floor beneath the beast is slightly depressed. Of course. The bear began its motion when I dropped into the pit. The floor's a pressure plate, and that's what activated it. So if that's true, then I just have to get off this floor. With the unstoppable ursine and closing pursuit, Gwendolyn Brass runs across the arena and launches herself at the jutting beam above. And with the grace of an acrobat, she catches it, swinging her legs off the ground. Hope this works. She clings to the beam, the bear stops, rears back on its massive hindquarters and... Please work. ...freezes into position. Well then, there's the hard part done. Now all I have to do is clamber out of this pit, defeat some guards, and give my so-called suitor a piece of my mind. Yet even as Gwendolyn begins her ascent, her brother Cyril is emerging from the Stygian blackness below the stage of the Royal Strahm Theatre. An uncomfortable silence has held between him and the self-styled phantom of the theatre ever since the youngest of the family brass glimpsed the shocking visage of his guide and saviour. There, that way is the street. Now go. Wait. Yes? I want to thank you, and to apologise. You saved my life, and I was extremely discourteous to you. Thank you. I know nothing of you. Which is what I desire. Very well. But we brass do not forget our debts, and you have done me a great kindness. My greatest wish is to be left alone. What is your second greatest? I... It is beyond your abilities, young man. (laughs) Mr. Stage Manager, sir, you would be surprised at the range of my abilities. There is a lady of the stage. She is a great actress, perhaps the greatest and I have been privileged to see her perform twice. It is my humble desire to meet her. Meet? Simply for the purposes of conversation. I see. And who is she? The great, the unparalleled Ellen Terry. Ah, actress is she? Divinity. Thespis herself granted mortal form. Well, my sister tends to know quite a few of these actor types. What say I bring it up with her and see if she can arrange a rendezvous? Are you serious? Of course. Least I can do. Now, mind, you'd have to be on your best behaviour, and you'd have to meet her in more suitable surroundings than lurking about the shadows of an abandoned theatre. I'd suggest someplace with a white linen tablecloth and a bottle of something pleasant. Yes, yes, and I would restrain myself. 
I have in the past been too great an enthusiast of gifted performers. Yes, last thing those artist types want is some enthusiasts slavering all over them. Indeed. If you could do this, Cyril Brass, I would be inestimably grateful. All right, then. You'll hear from me soon, and thanks again. Oh, and if you see Ponder, do let him know that he can find me at coffee tomorrow morning at the Alhambra Hotel, as we had planned. He is your friend? That's right. He's about half mechanical. Half his face is covered by a jeweled metal mask. An intriguing notion. Yes, you two might have more in common than either of you realize. Sounds like that's some of Trisono's men on the hunt. They will not follow you. I'll see to that. Goodbye, Mr. Stage Manager. Meanwhile, Lord Whitestone, also known as Tucknor King of the Ape Men, sits in a small side room on the third floor of the Blackfire Club, somewhat nervously perched on the chaise luge, while attempting to resist the persistent charms of Vincent Law's attractive hostess, Cecilia. What's got you so nervous, handsome? I'm concerned about my employer, Miss Tweet. Why, ever for? I'm sure Mr. Law is looking after her right enough. Now, why don't you relax and let me sit a little closer? If you were to be any closer, Miss Cecilia, you would be in my lap. What a lovely invitation. I didn't mean... Oh, now, look how snug I fit. Of course, it'd be better if you'd hold me around the waist and keep me from slipping right down your big, muscular thigh. Miss Cecilia, I'm uncomfortable with this familiarity. Well, then... Why don't I make you more comfortable? Basil, we've got to... Oh. Miss Tweet, are you all right? Doing just fine, thanks. Well, I was almost torn to pieces by a mechanical bear, and then there was a the minor difficulty of overpowering some bruises on my way here, but clearly I've not been suffering like you, Lord Whitestone. Lord Whitestone? I thought you was a valet. Please excuse the deception. That's rich. To her, you apologize. But when I was moments away of being chewed into little pieces, you were nowhere to be found. Who's that? Some of your employer's goons, I imagine. All right, you. Where do those French doors lead? Well, the third floor balcony. Good enough. Lord Whitestone, if you can extract yourself long enough to get us down to the street. Of course. Oh. Well, that was rather rude. Let's go. And mind how you hold me. You are my conveyance, not my companion. You're angry with me. How astute of you to notice. And with a daring leap, the jungle lord, holding Gwendolyn in one arm, leaps <gasps> over the balcony and with his other hand catches the railing of the floor below them, lowering his comely burden to the street. Thank you. Now I'll be going and I suggest you do the same. Unless, of course, you'd prefer to return to the embrace of that hussy. Of course not. Then good night, Lord Whitestone. Let me accompany you home? No need. I am quite capable of looking after myself, as this evening has made abundantly clear. Now, no doubt my parents are concerned regarding my absence, so I must leave. Farewell. Gwendolyn turns on her heel and strides off leaving a very perplexed jungle lord in her wake. Yet at that very moment, Lord and Lady Brass are not, as their daughter supposes, awaiting her return, for the infiltration of the court of the Graveyard King has been detected, and they are even now trapped inside his mechanical steam hearse, being taunted by the metallic voice of their enemy. Good evening, Miss Amy. By now you are, I hope, comfortable in the recesses of my steam hearse. It's him. You may be regretting your decision, but I assure you, there's little you can do now. A recording, I think. The doors to the carriage are, of course, locked and reinforced. Now, seeing you are both quick-thinking and observant people, you will have noticed two other things. That the engine is increasing in speed, and that there is an erratic knocking coming from the coffin in the back. Intolerable Frenchman. To the second matter, the knocking comes from Dr. Stamford, late of St. Bart's Hospital, who you asked to supply you with the corpse. Stamford is currently acting as a substitute for the corpse. At this point, however, he is still alive. 
the fiend! As to the first, the increasing speed of my steam hearse is the result of an unfortunate design flaw in the vehicle. It has a tendency that if unchecked causes the boiler to hypercharge, leading to an increase in velocity and an eventual explosion. I thought this was a dubious foreign manufacture. Now that you're on your merry way down Swain's Lane, I foresee one of two potential outcomes. Death from boiler explosion, or death from collision. Not bloody likely. Of course you may protest, and no doubt are working even now on the door locks, which you'll find are très complex. He's right about that. But can even you, Lord and Lady Brass, not only escape a hurtling death machine, but manage to do so without sacrificing the life of an innocent man? Well, can you? Benjamin, we need to stop! This hearse! Obviously, my love. The engine! Uh, how could we- No time. The engine on a steam carriage this size is fortified with sheet metal. Even if I get a door open, we're not leaving without Stamford. Then let's leave with him. Help me. We need to knock through to the rear deck where the coffin is. All right, we're through. And there's the coffin. Now what? Now? Oh. <laughs> Things get tricky. Kick open the door. We're going too fast to jump. We're not going to jump. We're going to ride. This coffin? Yes. That's insane. Your plan is? Oh. Dr. Stamford, have you out of there in a jiffy? In a jiffy? If this kills you, it'll serve you right. If this kills you, I'll mourn you forever. One, two, three! And with that, the intrepid pair push the coffin out of the back of the steam hearse and go skidding down the cobbled streets. Even as the coffin begins to disintegrate beneath them, the boiler of the hearse reaches maximum pressure and explodes. Meanwhile... Back at the Blackfire Club, the villainous proprietor Vincent Law is speaking with his pit boss. You're telling me that one woman, scarcely more than a girl, managed to fight her way past not only my mechanical bear, but no less than four of the men I laughingly call my muscle? Oh, two are in need of medical attention, sir. They'll get dressings after they've had a dressing down. And on top of that, Cecilia can't hold the interest of her bodyguard long enough to keep him from jumping out a window. Three floors up. I'm amazed they weren't killed. Roger, I am disappointed in these men. And I'm disappointed in you. And I'm disappointed in... Did I not say that I was under no circumstances to be... Oh, it's you. Indeed it is. I wasn't expecting a visit till the end of the week. I'll be making that as usual and expecting the proper payment. Fine. Then might I The minister ask... is inquiring after the girl who recently came into this establishment. Ah, uh -huh. well, you know, she's tougher than she looks. I'm glad to hear that. From her appearance, an effete dancing master wouldn't have a problem dealing with her. Two of our men require medical attention after dealing with her, and it worked from broken hearts. Quiet, Roger. It's certainly true that she's a scrapper, but if you could just tell the minister that next time we'll be better prepared... You can tell him yourself. Oh? Yes, day after tomorrow... He's requesting a meeting of the whole shadow government at eight in the morning. I don't recall there ever having been such a gathering before. A first time for everything. By the way, this gentleman, he's your muscle? I'm in charge of his muscle. Well then, you're in charge of making sure that Mr. Law attends this meeting alone. This is a meeting of people of influence. Lady, I don't like your tone. Roger! Please let him know that I will be honoured to attend. Tuesday morning, then.
Just who was that lady, anyway? Can't say I ever caught her name. What? You let some anonymous piece of stuff address you like that, boss? Roger! Some people command respect, not because of their name, but because of whose name they represent. A meeting of all London's crime bosses in one place? What could it be? And what is the character of the man or woman who could call such a meeting to order? And now that they've failed to kill any of the Brass family, what can we expect as the next order of business for the members of this so-called shadow government? Find out in the next episode when we return to the story of the first family of the realm, Brass. Brass is manufactured by Battleground Productions. For credits and more information on Brass, including our films and live stage shows, go to battlegroundproductions.org and find us on Facebook.